Hello and thanks for staying with us. Uh, this is Focus Nigeria. My name is Amechi Anapwe. Now every society uh, pursues development and this effort is on continuous basis. People strive to attain a new and better order that will guarantee higher standards of living. That's the aspiration of every society. Nigeria is no exception. The country is confronted with challenges of national development on a daily basis with measures taken to overcome them. The outcome so far for Nigeria is well known to all of us. Our places in socioeconomic indicators quite discouraging. In the first part of our discourse, Charles Mwekako, a professor of public administration who recently delivered the 47th inaugural lecture of Nasrawa State University who join us. The lecture bordered on new public management, national development, and transformation in a globalized world. After him, we will turn our attention uh, to examine the state of correctional uh, centers in Nigeria. Dr. Ike Zug, a member of the Independent Investigative Panel on Correctional Service Matters, will join us on ongoing reforms and tell us uh, what uh, the panel is doing to really and make our correctional centers truly correctional. It's not just to punish, but to reform and correct. Before we meet with them, let's update you on big issues in the news. And we start from the Senate, where, as expected, some will say the Senate uh, bowed to intensive pressures from some sections of the country and suspended legislative action on President Tinubu's tax reform bills. This came two days after the House of Representatives also suspended legislative action. A day before the Senate took this decision, the President issued a statement through the Minister of Information and National Orientation directing his Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice to uh, liaise with the National Assembly members with a view to uh, working out and possibly amending uh, removal or whatever of those very contentious provisions in the four tax reform bills. The Senate of the Federal Republic has known by everyone, and indeed other Senates in the entire world, are known to be stabilizers of every country. When there are difficulties, when there are disagreements, the Senate of each country at all time comes in with solution through dialogue and consensus to be able to solve such problems. And the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has been doing that since 1999. It's because of this we decided to put politics, ethnicity, regionalism aside to seize among ourselves in order to find the way forward in respect to the issues surrounding the tax reform bills. It is on this note that we extended our view to the executive arm of government and it was agreed that there should be a forum to sit down to look at the areas that are creating disagreements in order to resolve them so that the entire country will remain united united in our effort to solve our problems. Before the introduction of these bills, we know we've been faced with several problems, insecurity that we've been trying to solve, the president has been trying, and we're also we're working with him to solve issues about our economy, which is in line with global economic problems that we've been trying to solve. And we also agree that uh, we shouldn't allow any other thing to come in to aggravate problems of our country. It's on this note that has been agreed by the executive and also by us that there should be a forum that will sit with uh, the judiciary so that we can sit down and sort out all these problems. That was exactly the advice of the National Economic Council, a forum that comprises of the third sisters of the Federation with the vice president as chairman. They asked the president to withdraw the bill to pave the way 
for more consultations. The president said no. Uh, whatever amendments should be done in the course of legislative uh, processes, uh, eliciting a very strong push back. These are all avoidable only if the president had uh, taken heed of the advice of the National Economic Council and withdrawn the bill. Well, to another very controversial issue now, the old Portacol refinery that recently started uh, production recalled that immediately NMPC Limited and announced that it is going on stream now. There were media reports that it may not be the entire truth and that indeed part of what is taking place in the refinery is blending and not actual refining. And so uh, NMPC uh, organized uh, an eyewitness account tour of the refinery for journalists and AIT was part of it. And uh, now that we get to know better, I can see that mindset shifting now. Mindset is shifting. Now. So yes, it's just a misconception. The plant is fully on stream, as all the guests who have come in have seen, and producing very good quality product. And we're talking now. So let the message go out there that Potako Refinery is back, efficiently back, as you can see from the plant and the flare, doing very well. So if we send out this information. Sure. What, are you, what, are you, what are you talking out? Yeah, we're talking about products, quality prime products. We're talking about uh, PMS. We have AG in the pipeline. We're producing PMS. We're producing KO2. So all that will go out. But right now, we're talking about PMS. It's basically blended. The last phase of any refining operation is finishing. And in finishing, you make it to the spec you want basically by blending what you produce directly from the plant. So blending to produce PMS is the norm in the industry. And this is done with various components. And it is your specification from lab test that determine what you put in your plant. So that's basically So what you see here is sustainable, and we are putting a sustainability plan around it to operate, maintain uh, the plant to the highest standards and make sure that we continue day in, day out produce products that will enrich and help Nigeria to be day to day life. So we will continue doing this and as an NPC, we want to say thank you to our GCO for his um, steadfast uh, uh, perseverance for us to get to those points uh, in time and we will not disappoint him and disappoint NPC and Nigeria. Um, we're doing two things at the same time now. We're operating a life plant and we're in the construction mode as well. Yes. So this staff are responsible for all those things at the same time. So we're doing a double, double whammy approach with this staff, supported by our contractor staff as well. So that's what we're doing here. The old Potaka refinery in operation, uh, no doubt about that, that now, all doubts cleared, do not optimally, up, around 70% of installed capacity. We report that in the next few weeks, perhaps months, it will hit uh, optimal utilization capacity. What is, however, in doubt and what is of, of concern to me, for instance, is how should we manage these refineries? But old Potaka refinery, new one will come on stream soon, that of Wari and Kaduna. How should we manage them? Uh, should we allow NMPC to continue to operate and manage? How has it performed in the past? Do we uh, take a look at the LNG, Nigerian liquefied natural gas model, where a consortium of foreign companies uh, have controlling equity share of 51% while NMPC retaining 49% uh, mm -hmm. an arrangement that has proved to be a beauty. Shouldn't we consider that? Anyway, let's go for a break. When we come back, two issues uh, under our purview, national development and public management and correctional centers reforms. Do stay with us. The one who sent the bills to us. If he chooses to withdraw, so be it. But I personally, I personally, uh, will be disappointed. If the I can tell you, I can tell you that for free. Yes, because the president is well within his right in proposing bills to the national assembly, as he has done so. The process of consultation is continuing. You understand? Now, when we in the Senate have said go and uh, conduct a public hearing, we have passed it for second reading. 
The public hearing is the most important stage of consultation. All others could be informal, some could be formal. But at the public hearing, that is where all the stakeholders, all those who have anything to say about the bill, for or against, will have a right to appear and make their case. So in that, in that respect, the president is very well within his right. Yes, the bills could have undergone more robust consultation before being sent to the National Assembly. I agree perfectly with that. I was a governor too. So when governors who are members of the NEC, who are members of the governor's forum say, wait a minute, we need more interaction. I get the point they are making. Because they are heads of subnational entities who themselves are actively and directly affected by the, by the tax propositions before the National Assembly. So the governors are also right when they seek further consultation. And I think even in this process, the president and the executive team have an opportunity to continue that dialogue and engagement. But the president is within his right when he chooses to send a bill. So the both are right. Both are right. So much for staying with us. Uh, let's kick up right away with uh, discuss on national development. Professor Charles Mwekaku is of Public Administration Department, Nasrawa State University. He joins us now. Uh, thank you so much, Prof, for coming over. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on the 47 inaugural lecture you delivered last week at the Nasrawa State thank University. Thank you so much. I thank uh, AIT for the wonderful support I received from AIT. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure. Now, national development is a recurring decimal. It's a continuous process. Every society uh, strives to improve on its development level. Speak to this against the backdrop of Nigeria's uh, existence. Yes, uh, national development has been, um, uh, that is, uh, has been a burning issue, especially since our political independence in 1960. You know, after the political independence, the nationalists that took over from the colonial masters were desirous of bringing national development. And they started, that's why they launched in Nigeria, for example, they launched many development programs, such as farm settlement scheme, uh, plantation scheme, uh, oppression feed the nation, green revolution. Uh, the recent ones, uh, DFRI. Mm. Um, That's three the military. Yeah, military uh, under uh, um, IBB. Ibrahim Babangida. Yes, MAMSA under IBB again. Mm. And uh, um, this uh, NDE, uh, National Development of uh, Employment. Mm. Directorate of Employment. Yes, these are part mm. of the programs designed to bring national development in Nigeria. But surprisingly, the more they are implemented, the less we see the positive effect, simply because of the methods and the method they do approach. You named several development programs, yes. Programs and policies. Yes. We have national development plans, yes. uh, giving many different names. Yes. And these two, the more we churn them out, yes. like you rightly observed, the less developed we are. We, yes. we are, are losing ground. So it yes. tells us that Perhaps we are taking a wrong step in the wrong direction. Yes. Essentially, number one is that um, they started with the inherited bureaucratic system, which emphasizes hierarchy of authority, uh, routinization, that is, uh, doing routines on and on again, routine, routine routinization all over, all over, over again. again, and then filing system. And that's why when you go to many offices, they tell you that they can't see your file. Mm. Come back tomorrow or next time. And then they tell you that, well, you know, under this uh, system, that's why we enter a public office in Nigeria. You see about 20 to 30 staff there. They tell you that you will not be attended to because a single officer that is, is scheduled, it's not there. 
this shouldn't be, and this is one, well, two. shouldn't apportion schedule to each yes. officer? Yes, in available public officer, service? yes. Uh, public service should be reoriented in such a way that it should be responsive mm -hmm. to immediate need, immediate environment. So if the tax officer, for instance, that handles the issue of uh, uh, polio immunization is mm -hmm. not a seat, someone else. There should be somebody else that is also, right yes, away. that is familiar with it too, who can do it. You, want, you don't want, you don't have to state. That is one aspect. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is uh, this uh, issue of hierarchy of authority. In Nigeria, you find that, for example, the person at the top, Apex, mm. could be permanent secretary, could be director. Everything stops there. And the box you stops see, at the Everything table. stops there. And sometimes you have people who are not competent to occupy these sensitive positions and nothing moves. And so you find out that if you are under them and you try to tell them, oh, you want to teach me my job? And that is the end of you. And so things, and so most of the development programs are usually conceived in the office. People at the grassroots hardly participate. So it's usually top-down approach they adopt. And when you go there, it fails. So when you are planning, planning is a process. It has to involve every person. You have to involve It has to be inclusive. It has to be inclusive. And when it is inclusive, you see implementation successful. And that's why in Nigeria, you have many abandoned projects. Many abandoned, many white elephant projects. Uh, Jonathan, because, good luck, Jonathan, as president, yes. uh, did a study and uh, about as much as uh, 9,000 projects mm. in various stages of completion, some abandoned, abandoned for decades. Yes, look at the housing scheme, the one that was done under the Second Republic, where houses were some were built in the graveyards. Mm. So these things were not the priorities of the communities, but if you involve the people from the conception, they will tell you what they need. When they are part of it, they will see to it that that project is completed and they own it and secure it. But in Nigeria, people are not involved. And because people are not involved, they don't see that project as their project. They see it as government project. No person bothers to protect it. And they don't secure it. They don't secure it. Uh, we, quite right. I, I always give this example. If someone involved is involved as a community member yes. in, for instance, the installation of street lights, that person will have that attachment they will to that street light. Watching it, they'll be monitoring Day and night. it. Then they, they it. fold their hands and some other person come from somewhere yes. and do it. It's their own. Yes. They may even be those that will vandalize yes. this. And then the question is, why is it that successive regimes do not want to involve people mm. from the conception stage? because they're hiding a number of things. They want to award contracts that do not exist. Mm -hmm. They want to award contracts that exist, but that, uh, that is, a, if you hear the amount, in Nigeria, a project that will cost 100 million certainly will end up doing 1 billion because people do not participate. And that's why corruption keeps on going. But if you involve people, mm -hmm. if people are actively involved in the production process, you see that they will be accountable for whatever proceeds that so come out of So those it. in public office, those policymakers deliberately keep people away yeah. from conceptualization of development process. So that they projects, can make money. So that they can make money, make money in the process. Yes. That's, why, that's why in Nigeria, you see contract system. That's why people in Nigeria, somebody will be appointed as a minister. No, not make money, steal money. <laughs> uh, steal money. Uh, in Nigeria, some you see somebody yeah. appointed a minister. He starts to lobby in the portfolio he'll be given. They, want, they the, call it juicy, juicy portfolio. portfolio. National Assembly, the same thing. No person wants to juicy go. Juicy committee. Yes, the no Assembly. person wants to go and reactivate. Go to where they work in. Yes. They all want to juicy one, juicy one, juicy one. So Nigeria many people have asked the president, Obasan just started it, a minister of petroleum. Uh, Jonathan refused that, appointed mm. minister of petroleum. Mm. Uh, Yerado appointed minister of petroleum. Yes. Uh, Buhari uh, became minister of petroleum. Yes. And Tinubu is minister of petroleum. Yes. And people have said, if truly this president want to work, mm. they should have become minister of agriculture because mm. that's the mainstay. They don't need to be any minister if they want to work. What is leadership all about? Leadership is that person 
who knows how to assemble people, some are even more intelligent than him, mm. to achieve what he wants to achieve. Why must you be a president and you want to be minister? Who will report to you? Who do you report to? If I were Mr. President, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't hold any portfolio. I would get people who are smarter than I to hold those portfolios and report to me and tell me the right thing we do. And that's why our president, the first step, public statement he made was removal of fuel subsidy. When he hardly knew much about fuel subsidy, he came, remember that the Buhari regime had a plan that the, their budget could have lasted to June 30. Mm. Uh, Tinubu took over May 29. If I were him, I would have allowed that one month mm. to go on and study the system, set up a small committee, people, uh, of people who are knowledgeable in that area, mm. to study it and advise me appropriately. I can even give them two weeks before I know what to do. But he came up there, announced, and made himself see where we are. How many is, uh, <laughs> how, uh, how much is a liter of petrol today? Well, 1,100, 1,150. It's gradually coming uniform. down. Well, it it's peaked at 1, 2, 1, 3, but yes, gradually. Because um, the public is not taking note of that. Well, 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 it's coming down. Yes, yeah. it's coming down gradually. But you see it, it go up because it is controlled by the market forces of mm. demand. Fluctuations are always there. So that is what we are saying. So government should be sensitive. Government, you mustn't occupy all positions. Use other, and that is what new public man is talking about. Yes, involve as many people as possible. You talked about Nigeria inheriting the old public service structure. That's the bureaucracy. Yes, we know how it came about from yes. the French system and yes. all that. It, people acknowledge it's slow. People say it's uh, red tape, yes. but it's still the best system of administration. No, so the new public administration you're talking yes, about new public management. should it no, sorry new public management yes. should we replace the uh, bureaucracy yes, yes, yes the new public management mm. emphasizes the application of vital principles of private sector creativity innovation entrepreneurship and then lean government on mm. lean governance mm. in nigeria today we have uh, uh, is in, uh, almost uh, 50 ministers, between 48 and 50. Mm. You have a uh, minister. You have minister of state. All these people are drawing money from public fund. Mm. Do we need that? Do we need as much as 50? You're supposed to match these ministries. If I were Mr. President, I wouldn't have more than 20 ministers. And they will walk. You as as big as it is. Yes. 13 ministers, 13 so what, secretaries. So what are you doing with all these ministers? Mm. And their number of them are political jobbers. They don't have much to offer. They are being rewarded for political role they play. They shouldn't mm. be so. If people help you in campaign, settle them and get people who will do the work. How? Way. Settle them? How will they settle them? Find them who settle it. <laughs> <laughs> if you say settle as if they are to deep and somewhere. No, but no, no, I no. understand what you mean. Yes. There are some uh, areas, some mechanism you can use to settle those that yes. helped you to come yes. in government. I've always said that. I always hold this view. Those that help you to come into government are not always those that will help you run the government. Yes. Because there are dif different tasks. Yes. You can, there are other ways, yes. board appointments yes. and others. Yes. But there are two key terms you mentioned here. Yes. Creativity and innovation. innovation. And entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship. Yes. Uh, these are and not just that. seen in the seen, private sector. Sorry, seeing the citizens mm. just as customer. If you're in the private sector, do you play with your customer? No. Because customer is the customer is, is king. He mm. pays your salary. You don't play with them. You do everything to please them. The new public management emphasizes that citizens should be seen as customers, mm. as kings. If they are customers, they should be fully involved in whatever happens. So mobilize them. And when you mobilize them, you see the difference. I always like to draw people back to Nigeria, Biafra Civil War. Mm. That war started without any notice. So Biafra didn't prepare. And then federal government say, wait until we will wipe up Biafra. But that war lasted for 30 months, OK? Not just that it lasted for 30 months. Two superpowers in the world, America and Soviet Union, for the first time in world history, supported federal government. Yet Biafrans resisted. What happened? They applied a number of principles of new public management. Now They mobilized every person in Biafra. 
80%. And they were all part of it. People, including children. So now, I know the current bureaucracy yes. is all about hierarchy. <coughs> right? Hierarchy, qualification. It's all about qualification. Where you come from. Uh, Federal years character. Of experience. State of origin. And all that. Yes. And it stifles. It stifles yes. Yes. innovation and creativity. Yes. So how do we infuse this into the system now? Yes. First is that what government needs to do, first, our educational system is not good enough. Our educational system produces job seekers mm. instead of job makers. The essence of education is for you to acquire skills that will help you to conquer your environment. Conquering your environment means harnessing the natural resources and turning it to, uh, into use, into goods and services. That is what education means. So our current educational system is not doing that. You have to restructure our current educational system and make it functional so that products of our universities and other institutions shall be job makers. Job makers, that is why. And that's why in Plato's Republic, he emphasizes that any country that wants to develop must not play with education. And education should not be left in the hands of private people that government should run education, make that education functional, make it free, and make it compulsory so that every talent in the state shall develop. In Nigeria, government has neglected education. And that's why people in government, they send their uh, children abroad to read because mm. our universities here are not good enough for their children. They understand that fact. They take that. And that's why they don't equip our hospitals. They all go abroad, even mm. when they have simple headache. They go abroad because they don't trust our uh, our hospitals here. So that for, to change be. this, you yes. said Absolutely. we should start from the education yes. system. Educational system, that is uh, one. Two, make it skill, uh, skill and knowledge oriented. oriented. Yeah, so that the ones that will fit into modern yeah, day reality. So that when graduates come, they will be job makers and not job seekers. It, it's in Nigeria that one, after acquiring first degree, he goes back to roadside to mm. go and learn. Is it, is it in Nigeria is that you go to a banking hall, yes. you see chemists as bank tellers? Yes. So yes. He tells us there's yes. a huge problem. And that's why foreigners man our economy. Foreigners control our economy. Oil is the greatest foreign exchange earner for Nigeria. And that oil is being controlled by foreigners. Let me mention five leading oil companies. Total, uh, Shell, Chevron. Um, Ajib and so forth. And they are gradually and withdrawing. They, they are withdrawing because and of the, the environment. Yeah, and the Nigerian uh, indigenous, yes. indigenous businessmen are moving in. That is investing. Gradually. That is investing because mm. of uh, we cannot, some sort of policies we make. I, that are I, making I, I, the environment. I raised this argument with someone. Yes. I said, you have the Seplat, you have these indigenous uh, oil companies, but mm. they told me that. Even in those so-called indigenous oil companies, there are... It's people in government. No, that there are some foreign interests. It's yes. the Nigerian partners that mm. make up the Nigerian component. Yes. That they influence yes. the majority of equity are still foreign. I agree with you. But it's over true. time, we need to begin to acquire that capacity. Yes. The likes of Dangotes that and all that. Yes. That will not happen until we get the leadership we desire. Any day Nigeria gets leadership she desires, things will change. Leadership, according to Machiavelli, mm. determines the rise or fall of any state or organization. A leader can, that captures the imagination of his country. There's mm. no limit to the development of that country. Okay, uh, as we conclude now, uh, you are to advise the head of service of the Federation and the President in terms of this new public management yes. principle. Yes. How should they achieve it, replacing that with the existing bureaucracy? First is system. that, yes, new public management emphasizes some principles. There are many ways of doing it. Alternative service delivery, critical path method, mm -hmm. cost-benefit analysis, uh, corporate governance, code of, uh, board of directors. These are, uh, they preach a number of principles that you can inject into the public service mm -hmm. and make it creative, make it responsive. How, how would that Make it innovative. That? Yes, when you, because this thing for alternative service delivery tells you that there are many ways of doing something. Explore the many uh, alternatives and come up with them that offers greatest benefit. You choose it. But the current 
public service system we are doing, no. He said due process must be followed. And this due process... You uh, are one of the Bureau of Public Service Reforms. Yes. They have been there for years. Is the problem when you set up these things, you get, because of state, of, the people you put there, mm. state of origin, religion, you put them there. I want my brother to be there. And your brother is not doing anything. Okay. So we'll, people who can deliver are not allowed to come into governance. We we'll have to so leave it there. So this is the problem. Professor Charles Mwekako, Professor of Public Administration, you can see, uh, proposing a new model, uh, bureaucratic administrative system uh, that will replace the existing one that is inefficient, corrupt, and slow with one that is indeed creative, innovative, and the one that is result-oriented. We see how this advocacy will go, whether <laughs> government will key in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. We believe that in Nigeria we won the Absolutely, change. absolutely. Yeah, let's we take want a, a new Nigeria. Yeah, uh, let's take a break when we come back. Uh, correctional center reforms. So it's all about reforming institutions and processes in Nigeria. Do stay with us. In 2019, former president Muhammadu Buhari signed into law the Nigeria Correctional Service Bill to help promote the reformation, rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders, ensuring compliance with international human rights standards and providing a platform for the implementation of non-custodial services. However, correctional facilities across the nation have continued to witness a series of attacks and destruction. One of such is the recent damage at the medium security custody center Suleja in Niger State after heavy rainfall wreck havoc at the facility. Key players at this round table are of the opinion that the continuous destruction of infrastructure and escape of inmates underscore the urgent need for enhanced security measures and modernization of Nigeria's correctional system. This section 12 requires notification of relevant authorities and prompt action to ratify overcrowding. We therefore request that this very important provision, specifically subsection 4 and 12 or section 12 of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019, be immediately implemented. If we had this implemented and people were actually visiting the custodial every custodial centers every month, I doubt that we would and not just visiting them as a box ticking exercise, but visiting them to implement everything that the act has said they should. I doubt that we would get to the point where we are at. We are calling on the government to prioritize these issues because if that continues and the pretrial detention issues keep escalating will keep on radicalizing more Nigerians. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, Professor Charles Mweka, who spoke in the first part of our discourse on the need to reform our public service to make it efficient. And we'll continue uh, on the uh, note of reforms. This time, correctional service, uh, an area that was bequeathed, the structures and institutions bequeathed to us uh, by our colonial master, same with uh, the public service administration, but one that is begging for reforms. And, uh, one will say receiving attention because efforts are on. My guest is Dr. Ike Zugo, member, investigative panel on correctional service matters. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you our listeners and viewers all over the world. So it's all about uh, reforming institutions and correctional centers. If you ask anybody, it's one area where we need uh, loads of reforms. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, every system or public service system from time to time go through different uh, processes that uh, require reform. And uh, some people will say, why do we always have re reform? It's like vehicles for those who drive vehicles. No matter how much you align the tires of your vehicle, the wheels, at some point as you continue to use, you will realize that it's gone out of alignment. Mm -hmm. uh, the tires have gone out of balance, so you need to keep balancing. Uh, but one thing again we're looking at is how do we reduce this and also how do we make the most of the opportunities to take any reform 
like the correctional service you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, correctional service we had in Nigeria started around 1861. It was bequeathed us by the colonial masters, and they came in then with uh, the British uh, style of uh, uh, prison. By around 1917, it went through the first reform mm -hmm. uh, then, and uh, what came with that reform was uh, a bit of harmonization of how inmates are taken, how they are treated, and categorization. And then in around uh, 1931 or thereabout, another set of reform came, which brought in modernization by LV, uh, I can't remember the complete name mm. then. And then after that also, a whole lot continued to happen. Some are minor reforms. By 2019, we have the Correctional Act again, which was a major reform that changed it from prisons to mm. corrections. And initially, prison was more focusing on punitive, while correction focuses on uh, uh, reconstruction of the individual and then reintegration, reformation, if mm. I will use the right word, reformation and reintegration. And then uh, after that has happened, we still see that there are issues in the system. And any government that thinks well, mm -hmm. or individuals in places of authority that think well, you cannot go and rest and say, oh, simply because uh, we have been going through a manner of reform, mm -hmm. you keep working until you get the system right. But what necessitated what we are doing now in mm -hmm. the independent investigative panel? Mm -hmm. That was set up by the federal government. By the federal government, by yeah. the Ministry of Interior, mm -hmm. headed by Dr. Olubumitu. Ojo. If you remember, around September, there were some information that went viral mm. about uh, some kind of uh, activities within the correctional service. One of them was Abdul Rashid Minor uh, raised an alarm that uh, a correctional service officer, the officer in charge of the Kujie prisons then, mm. was extorting him, getting some monies mm. through his account. And he showed evidence that the monies were paid in even through the a uh, personal account of the correctional officer, which is not uh, within what is allowed by the law and the standard operating the, There are other, uh, huge yes. allegations, though there were some quick investigations on that one. The all part uh, the of what we're doing. Saga part of it. And all that. It's part of yeah. it. So the Bobriski saga also. Then the Honorable Minister of Interior, uh, Dr. Olubumi Tunji Ojo, set up the Independent Investigative Panel on Correctional uh, Service Matters, which I am one of them. Yeah. And we are five in that panel, selected from different places with different levels of expertise that we are so bringing So what in. are you doing? Now, what are you investigating? Is it... Uh, all these allegations, we have highlighted some of them? Absolutely. It was actually divided into two parts. The very first part was to look at those uh, issues, specific issues of complaint from Abdul Rashid Minor mm -hmm. and the one raised by Bob Risky, which he alleged that he, I don't know whether it's he or she, or him, Shim, alleged that uh, he, uh, he did not spend... Is it he? Is it he? Uh, well, from the correctional document said, it's a he. Okay, uh, let's not argue mm, that. Mm. So he alleged that he didn't spend his uh, sentence in the correctional facility. So the Honorable Minister wanted that investigated to be sure what exactly must have transpired. And then the allegation of Abdul Rashid Minor. And these two were grouped into the very first phase of the work of the Independent Investigative Panel. But because the minister said, look, I'm not just looking at how to do one piecemeal approach to solving the problem because what has manifested is an indication of a huge challenge in the system. Let's assume we have not been proactive in correcting them. Let us at least be effectively reactive in getting a sustainable result. So the second part of it now was to investigate the complete system the correctional facility, there's almost about 240 of them across the country, mm -hmm. and then see how the system is running with respect to how the inmates are treated, with respect to how they are fed, with respect to issues relating to human rights abuses, issues relating to corruption, 
and all things, including the facilities and the welfare of the mm. correctional service or things that could uh, give rise to corruption or support uh, inefficient services. So, and that we, we are giving one year as a second phase of that. We have finished the first phase, we've submitted our report, and mm. then part of our recommendations also have been, uh, we are seeing them already implemented mm. on the first phase, which consigned Abdul Rashid Minor mm. and um, uh, Bob Risky. Now we are entering into the second phase, even though we started a part of that second phase, but we are going into the major part of it. That major part of the second phase will require us visiting most of the correctional surface centers. So what we look, are you also going to take a look at issues of corruption? Absolutely. As a major canker war. Absolutely, because we cannot talk about effective correctional service uh, without dealing with issues of corruption. And even from the late on the first phase, we have seen the corruption is already evident. So we will be doing a fact-finding visit to the correctional services, and we will also be engaging the stakeholders, all the critical stakeholders of correctional service in Nigeria. We will also be engaging the public. So we are saying we don't just want to rely on the information mm -hmm. we are going to gather from the correctional service centers mm -hmm. or facilities or from even the stakeholders because there are chances that some of the stakeholders will present the information in a manner that suits them. We also want to engage the public, interact with people who have, by one way or the other, experienced correctional service. Mm -hmm. Whether their experiences were good or not, whatever it is, we want to hear them. Those who are currently even in the correctional service and they have issues they want to report, we are ready to take them. Those they should send to your committee? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And those who also have passed through the system either as inmates or have, done really, have had relationship or business with the correctional service, we want to hear them. We want to know what was the business experience like mm -hmm. or what was your stay or your serving sentence in the correctional service like? Mm -hmm. What was your experience like? With relate, in relation to anything and everything. And we are be, to be sure that we do not miss out anything, mm -hmm. we are ready to take complaints from people, even anonymously. Mm -hmm. So even if you're Without providing personal yes, details. If you're not... Now, it, it's good to hear that you're going around mm -hmm. and all that to get first-hand information. And, you know, it's, it's said, there's a general dictum that if mm -hmm. you want to see how a country mm. treats its citizens, mm. go to its prison. You've heard about that. Absolutely. Now, I, I, I just want to challenge the members of this investigative panel. If you go to the prisons, eat the food they mm. serve our inmates. Okay. It will tell you a lot. <laughs> okay. Just let them serve it to you as breakfast or lunch, uh, or even dinner. Uh, let me also, it may impress you to know that apart from the visits we are going to do, mm. we will eat the food. We already have started visiting. I personally have been to Ikoyi medium security prisons, Krikri medium and maximum security prisons. That was when we were chasing facts about mm. uh, uh, Bob Risky mm. claim. Kuje uh, medium security prison, mm. prisons when we were a correctional facility, mm. not prison, sorry. When we were also investigating the Abdul Rashid minor. Last week, for the whole of last week, I was in Anambra State uh, Correctional Service uh, uh, Centers, about four of them. We saw a whole lot uh, by ourselves, and uh, we saw need for uh, quick reform, and not just the ad hoc things they mm. do as reform, reforms that can deliver sustainable results. So there are issues, real issues. Uh, the decay, some of them have lasted for a very long time. Mm. Some have become systemic. But we are looking at how can we bring Up lasting solutions. Uh, so, some solutions may require legislation. Absolutely. Some may require change of policies, amendment yeah. of either existing legislation or even new policy, uh, amendment of existing policies. Very okay. correct, but not only that. Mm. There are also some areas that we require a new a paradigm shift in the way that the agencies that work together with matters relating to correction, how do they relate? Because one thing about correctional services mm -hmm. that it's easy for anybody to talk about what is happening in the prison for mm -hmm. in the correctional centers. For example, the congestion. Mm -hmm. Everybody is worried about how is it that we have over seventy-seven thousand 
inmates. Mm -hmm. And in, in a facility that is um, meant to accommodate... Not a, I'm looking at across the country, yes. not a facility. Now, That's some, across the country. Yes. Uh, it, these are with a combined capacity for perhaps not up to 10,000. Not up original to, to 20,000 yeah. yeah. to be... Uh, mm. Not up to 20,000. Mm. Because there are... What we have seen in some places, even in a number, of course, we saw one that is under... Uh, uh, not uh, congested, mm. one. The okay. one in Aguata. Okay. Uh, but every other one was over congested. And some were over 30, 40% uh, yeah. congestion level. Yeah. And then the worry is this uh, correctional service or correctional center, nobody finds himself as an inmate into the correctional center without going through a route. There's mm. a route for mm. that. And that route is the police and the judiciary. But that's so, why I talked about those institutions whose operations bear on correction. Absolutely. Uh, so, and uh, correctional services, what they do is to, on court order, hold somebody in safe custody and prevent, present the person. So they can't even release anybody mm. on the For instance, Dele Faro Timi was uh, uh, reminded uh, yes. in, a in a correctional center in the Kitty State by a magistrate court. Yes. Uh, so, and then it's their responsibility to keep him and bring him back safely when he's required by the law. They can reject him. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means that sometimes they, they have must to, have to find a uh, uh, They must have to mm -hmm. sometimes, even though there are also provisions that when they get to a certain level of uh, conjecture and they take certain steps by informing the chief judge mm -hmm. of the state and the uh, police, they can reject. But that is not going on as we speak mm. because there are also other implications mm, that need sense. to be dealt with. Now, so, okay, now there are uh, constitutional, we talked about legislations and policies. Mm. And I also know, I don't know whether it has passed, mm. the uh, transfer of correctional services from exclusive lists in our constitution to concurrent in such a way mm. that states can also operate and manage correctional centers. Mm. A lot of people have said, maybe in the long run, that could be part of the solutions. Yes, it's a proposal that is ongoing that I have also a lot of people that are showing interest in that, mm. the same way that uh, many are also talking about state policing. Mm. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that whether in uh, concurrent list or exclusive list, uh, if we do not deal with the challenges on they are at their root, we are not also going to get something. The underlying meaningful. factors. Yes, because the fact is that they are human beings that run the system. So let's assume, for example, state begin to run their correctional service. Mm. They are often or sometimes going to also borrow what they have seen in the system that is currently ongoing. They may even have some staff that we want to, for their experience or whatever, transfer to state. And what they are going to carry on is the same system, the same understanding. If there's no new orientation, even the state also, in their design and construction and implementation of correctional service, if there is no good, better framework to address the challenges we have seen in the current system, they may not have incentives to build a system that will be better off. So it's not necessarily about whether it's with the state or whether with the federal government. What we're looking at is that the service delivery in the correctional service, mm. how do we deal with the inefficiencies? How do we deal with the issues that have emerged as we have run this? Very important. It's a system that has run for about 161 years by reason of what I told you when I started mm. in 1861. Uh, so, and then a whole lot have happened. And you can also separate what is happening in correctional service with what is happening in the larger society. So, but, it mirrors the yes, larger society. Yes, but the challenge is this. The correctional service being what it is now, not punitive, mm. but more of a uh, re, uh, re reformatory. reformatory. Have we really achieved that beyond the name change? So uh, yeah, that's the point. Mm. So now, if we don't deal with that, we'll continue to have the same result that some people that go into correctional service come back to the society to become worse. Mm. Those who are not even criminals, because it's not everybody in correctional service that there are some of them either by technicalities mm. of the law or by error or by whatever reason, they are innocent and they found themselves in correctional service. 
you can see that like when we talk about 77 inmates, we mm. have about... Uh, uh, 77,000. 77,000. We have about 35,000 as are waiting trial. Mm. Those are waiting trial men. You can't even are say presumed they're, innocent. Yes, they are presumed. Including mm. some of those that the law have convicted because there are some of them that are convicted that they are truly innocent. Either mm. something yeah. happened or there are technicalities or issues which we know. I, I just so, hope that this uh, investigative panel will not end up as one of the many we see. Mm. I just hope uh, a lot of people that have. we you will take this to fruition and uh, when this your report is submitted, that will to implement will be there. Okay, a lot of people have expre uh, expressed this same concern mm. and uh, of course I give it to them because we live in a system where we see all manners of mm. things and panels like this being established and then they come up with reports and nothing is done with their report. But one of the things that got me personally involved in this is for what I see with the determination of the Honorable Minister of Interior, uh, Honorable Dr. Olubumi Tunji Ojo, I got close and found that he wasn't playing with this. It is something there to his heart. And he's somebody, for what I have seen, who have the political will to do the right thing. He has demonstrated that in many ways. A typical example was that when he started as a minister, there were issues with immigration and passport. Mm. He said that we deal with this issue within a short space of time, and he took steps and he dealt with it. He also talked about the issue of corruption in the immigration side and how he thinks that the best way to approach it is to reduce human contact. Mm. And he started implementing the contactless. Because it's at the point of contact yes. that... All devices take so, place. And what he has done with that, which is not what I'm talking about now, some other nations are coming to borrow that. Then, But relating it back to what we are doing with respect to corrections, when we started, he said to us, he does not want to be involved, does not want anybody to telegraph what we are doing, and he set it as independent investigative panel and said to us, as soon as you make your report known to me, I will put it in the public. No matter what it is, if I don't put it in the public within a period of one week, put it in the public yourself so that the public will see what you have see, uh, seen, what you are recommending, and hold me accountable. If I when are you implement. likely? Uh, because we have mm. to be attaching timelines. So, we also, uh, the, so, <laughs> we also uh, carry on some oversight functions. When will this report be submitted? Okay, we, we are giving one year because mm. of the massive nature of the work. Mm. Like I told you, we are covering over 240 correctional service centers across the country. Mm. And we want to get sufficient sample to be able to generalize mm. whatever is our finding. And then um, in the first one, which we did, I have said, we came up with our report. He made it public. Mm. There are correctional officers that we That's are That's interim report? Not interim. I want to call it phase one. Okay, Why phase one. I say it's not interim. So when will the final phase be? One year in, from now. For one year from now. From now. So we are hoping that at worst by December mm. uh, 2025, we should be done with this. We are actually starting public hearing on this on the, from the second we're having public hearing in two phases. Mm. We are now asking the public to submit their complaints. Mm. Whatever you have experienced in correctional service, submit a complaint or report about it or information you have. And it can be submitted to the Office of the Permanent Secretary, mm. Federal Ministry of Interior, which is in Area 3, okay. Gariki. Or you can also do by email, which is uh, independent panel, independent uh, uh, investigative panel, sorry, investigative panel at interior.gov.ng. And um, we are going to have the first phase of the public hearing on the 12th and 13th of December. Okay. And mm -hmm. then the second phase will be from okay. 13th of We're out of January. time, really. We have to thank you so much, mm -hmm. Dr. Ike Ezugo, member of that mm -hmm. investigative panel, Correctional Service Matter. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, my brother Mechi, for mm -hmm. having me. And yeah, thank it's, you, it's all pleasure. our viewers and mm -hmm. followership all over the world. This, uh, it will, I believe, mm -hmm. it will help us to yeah, build uh, a absolutely. sustainable reform in that system. Thank, thank you thank also you. for mm -hmm. being part of it. My name is Amit Chanap. We'll have a good time. Mm -hmm.